<laughs> we, I hope the live broadcast caught that. I just yeah. clicked go live. Uh, That's me in a nutshell. Behind, <laughs> behind the scenes, Sam is here ready to dish out legal advice, but she also is an experienced pizza dough creator. I've been making so much quarantine life has been mostly pizza and pasta dough making. And I have to say it has gotten better. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pizza, pasta. You have any other go-tos? I just cook constantly. I make everything, but I really, I've been using quarantine time to make everything myself. So I've been making my own pizza sauce and pasta sauce, like bringing yeah, all yeah, that stuff from too. scratch. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. good. I wish okay. I could deliver to Columbus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can. You could. Yeah, that's true. That's just, true. I know you're not doing anything. You yeah, could drive, I'm not busy. <laughs> drop it off. I'll put my address on there. Um, so for any of you who are rolling in here, it's nice to see some. I can see some of you starting to peek your heads in. For those of you, we're at 10 a.m. here on Eastern. So if you're a West Coast or Central, maybe a little earlier. Some of you still a little sleepy, sleepy heads. Um, but what better conversation to wake up to than talking about legal needs that your business has that you're confused about and it's it you were rightfully confused about because it's a whole confusing system um but sam is here so this is all sam does so sam why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and um and then we can kind of just get into it if anybody has questions hop into the comments below um, whatever channel or whatever sort of platform you're on, we'll see those, we'll pull them up and we'll answer them in real time. So if you have any, you've kind of got a lawyer who's smart on, you know, on the phone right now. So, uh, take advantage of that. Cause I, if I think correctly, lawyers typically bill hourly sometimes and it's more expensive. So, um, get your money's worth, drop a comment in there, ask any kind of questions and we'll kind of dive into it. So, um, Sam, tell us a little bit about you. Let the people know what you're doing, what you're up to and uh, where you come from. Yeah, thanks Adam. Um, so I'm Sam Vanderwielen. I'm an attorney turned entrepreneur, legal educator, and I help small businesses like coaches, service providers, and online creatives legally protect and grow their online businesses with my DIY legal templates and my ultimate bundle program. So I was a fancy pants lawyer back in the day, uh, worked high atop a skyscraper in Philadelphia, where I was born and raised, still live today, and um, I was pretty darn miserable, <laughs> and I left that life behind, actually, at first, to become a health coach, so I wanted, like, nothing to do with the law or anything like that, okay. and I left it all behind in 2016, yeah, 2016, pre, pre-quarantine and everything, and I um, had that business for about a year, but in running that business, um, although I was getting health coaching clients, I got even more inquiries about like what the heck's an LLC and how do I send a contract and like, what do I need to know? And it piqued my interest. I decided to go with that interest and there's been no looking back. So like three, That's four cool. years later, here I am. <laughs> That's really cool. I didn't know that. I didn't know the health coaching part of your story. I needed a buffer. I think a lot of people say that like I needed something else. It also got me into this world that we're in right here right now where I had to learn, you know, I was also new to all of this. I didn't know what a landing page was. I didn't have a Facebook page. Like, all of these things. So I'm really glad if anyone else has had that experience, I think it's helpful to go through that with the thing that you don't end up, you know, with. <laughs> yeah, no, that mm -hmm. makes, it makes a lot of sense. I had, uh, I was, I was loading box at UPS was a nice buffer job for me. Um, yeah. You like, learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You learn a lot. Um, you learn what kind of jobs the you cheesecake don't factory in college. Cheesecake and I factory? think <laughs> I worked at cheesecake factory in college and I swear I lean on the knowledge, the customer service knowledge there all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like pretty, that's pretty standard education. Everybody needs to have. Yep. Uh, TJ Everybody needs to work. TJ was my, uh, my college gig, which changed my life probably. Mm -hmm. Um, truth, truth. Um, so we can get into some things, uh, or we have, Mary just dropped in a question on Facebook. If we want to just take Mary's question, we Sam's very comfortable. So we've done this workshop in, in our actual studio of the wonder jam and Sam will sit here and do Q and a like all day. And so that's very safe. If anybody has questions, you're not like interrupting the flow. Um, Sam also could probably just talk through, you know, 50 things um, off the top of her head or, or that she talks about often. So um, feel free to jump in and ask some questions. I've got some questions loaded that we're going to sort of pull out of Sam as well, but want to make sure that if anybody's watching, we're getting yours. So we'll jump into Mary's. Is that cool? Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. So Mary's first question, business is an LLC wondering if need a DBA 
uh, if we simply want to drop the LLC from our business cards, logos, websites, all that other stuff. So if somebody has a business that's an LLC and you know, you're, you're writing that on things like it's on your checks as the Wonder Jam LLC is what our, it's what our mm -hmm. checks say. Um, but I want to, I don't like LLC. I think it looks lame and it's not cool at all. And so I want to write the Wonder Jam on things. What, how do I need to treat that for it to be sort of, um, treated well and officially and, and all of those things? Yeah, I love this question, Marie, because one of the things that's really smart behind your question is the fact that you know that just for anybody else that's listening, when you have an LLC, you want to use that full name and the moniker as much as humanly possible if you don't have a DBA, right? So if you don't have something tied back to that LLC. So for anybody else who's listening, DBA stands for doing business as, and sometimes in your state, it might be called a trade name or an alternate name. They Everybody calls it something a little bit different. All it really means is like, what's the name that you want to be known as in commerce, like in real life, right? So the example I always give is that everybody's favorite store, Target, their corporate name is actually Target Brands Inc., right? But we all know them as Target, so they have a DBA as Target. Um, because nobody would want to walk up to Target seeing Target Brands Inc. on the side of the building. Like that would be really boring. It's not cute. So, yeah, not cute. So that's just so everybody knows, like that's pretty much how this works. So with your question, Marie, like when, if, if it were me, I would definitely register what I want to be going as if like you were just dropping the moniker LLC, for example, I would probably register a DBA mostly because there's very little issue with doing so. So like it's typically very, fast, it's a lot cheaper, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you just want to make sure that in the more official places, though, that you list this. So like, for example, on the bottom of your website, maybe you would have your LLC name, like it would have the copyright symbol of the year and your LLC name, and then your DBA, um, depending on how different those two are, or maybe if you're just dropping the moniker, you, you leave it. Um, but I love this idea for more like the day-to-day -day marketing, like your Instagram page is probably not, you probably don't want to throw the LLC up there or something like that. For people like me though, where the business, I, like I had a business where it had a creative name and now when I created this business, it's just Sam Vanderweel and LLC. So because it's my name, I don't want people to get confused that I'm not just like a personal brand, this is actually a business now at S Corp. So on my website, for example, where it has my header, my masthead on my website, I have LLC put in there just because I want people to know that this is a business, right? And not that this is not my like personal blog or something like that. So it kind of depends on the name, but overall, yes, I would use it. Um, there's not really a huge downside. Usually you can register multiple DBAs, all of that kind of stuff. You just then want to be consistent with how you're using it across different platforms. Beautiful. Is there, can I, I'm a follow-up question on that. So is there... I think, can, can you talk a little bit about um, one of the things that I end up telling people often, and I, I'd love for you to kind of elaborate on this, is you can't stop someone from suing you or you can't like, yeah. there's a lot of things that you're doing when you're navigating the legal needs of your business, where you are more like mitigating risk than you are doing things officially. So in your response to Mary, you had said, you know, you want to use the full moniker as much as possible. Can you talk mm -hmm. about like why the underlying why behind that? Because I know sometimes when people start, when we have these conversations about legal concerns with your business, it's important to sort of understand the spirit of what's trying to be done because then it helps you make decisions later like this when they sort of come up. Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked this, Adam, because I think it's really important to start out by talking about what the purpose is of legally protecting your business. And yeah. just like Adam's pointing out, the purpose is not for you to block yourself from ever being able to be sued unless we all move out of America or have like a radically different legal system overnight. This legal system is wild, you guys. And I spent like five or six years with my like face in my hands because I could not believe the stuff that would come across my desk. You know, people literally can sign contracts in this country saying you can't sue people for stuff and they turn around and sue them. And as I always say, there's no little old lady at the courthouse who like is checking your papers to see how true it is. It's that's really what courts are for. We work out the truth in the courtroom. And so there's not a gatekeeper. So I always analogize this to like, 
it, this would be like eating perfectly your entire life thinking that you could never be afflicted by disease or get sick. And we mm -hmm. just know that that's not true, right? That's not also the purpose of treating our bodies, right? It's to feel better in the meantime. And yeah. so I think it's kind of similar here. Like we're not setting ourselves up to make sure we never get sued. We're putting ourselves in the best position to be able to handle it. And like Adam mentioned about using the LLC moniker, the reason that that's so important is because there are certain things that you can control how you get sued or when you get sued or where or and all these kinds of things. So for example, if you have an LLC, you're, you're doing that so that you personally separate yourself from the business. You want it to be so that if you were to get sued, really your business gets sued, but you personally are not. And so the reason that I always advocate for using that LLC moniker as much as humanly possible is to establish that connection that you are an LLC to be op operating your business like an LLC so that if someone sued you, you'd have a really good argument to say, you can't include me personally in this lawsuit, only my business. Yeah, I think I think understanding that helps. We, we I walked, you know, entrepreneurs are like a, a risk taking group of people. Yeah. And even the more cautious of entrepreneurs are still risk taking sorts of people um, relative to their non entrepreneurial friends. And it's I think one of the reasons and this was true for me, but one of the reasons we sort of avoided so many legal conversations early was because I was just didn't want to be go live <laughs> in a cave, right? Like yeah. I'm comfortable with risk. It's part of why I'm doing the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and legal always seemed like something, these, these legal considerations were always something that squashed any of that. Um, it's actually it, why I started my business. So funny you say that because um, one of the things that frustrated me about legal the most, and maybe you guys can relate if you've ever talked to a lawyer in person uh, or over the phone, is that they tend to just be no people. Like they're kind of like parents. They just like tell you all the things that you can't do. And I knew, I always knew I was a businesswoman at heart. I created like a ton of businesses since the time I was a kid. But when I was at the firm, I would like get off the, you know, my boss would get off the phone with someone just telling them all the different ways they couldn't do something and it was impossible. And I would pick up the phone in my office and be like, I know he just told you that you can't do this, but have you thought about doing it this way? And so it really bothers me that people, that they stick their head in the sand because they're afraid of being told no. And so hopefully you guys feel comfortable asking questions here, whether now or later, but like, I'm more about like, let's maybe you can't do it exactly that way, but here's how we could in yeah. a safer way. Yeah. No, I think that's really cool. So one of the things that I found, and when we sort of hang out inside of the gym club, we watch, there's a number of people who hang out in there or gym clubs are online community. Um, and we, and Sam hangs out in there a little bit. And, um, one of the things that comes up a lot is we, there's a lot of people in, in the world as it sits right now who are maybe they had like a little side hustle thing or they had something mm -hmm. that they were kind of like brewing on the side, whether that was coaching or they were writing about certain types of things or they were maybe a yoga instructor at a studio. But now they're like, oh, I want to do a bit more of my own and I want to kind of create my own things. When people are just getting started, maybe a, imagine a one person business. Um, what? are sort of the main things if you were advising somebody, make sure that you're sort of legally legit in these ways. What does that look like? Yeah, yeah there are usually like three pillars that I start with. So the first is forming your business because even if you only have one client or a smattering of clients or you're just trying to get a client, we still want to personally separate you from the business. And in my experience, there's uh, a tendency to run in the sole proprietor direction because of some bad information that we've found online or some like myths that are floating around out there. So really step one is forming it, setting it up properly. That doesn't have to be that hard or expensive. Step two is that if you're working with anyone or ready to work with anyone having a legit contract to send them. And three is business insurance. And people always get freaked out about when we talk about business insurance, but I'm like, you know, it's based on your revenue. So it doesn't have to be super expensive if you're not making a lot of money. But personally, like this for me would be like, I wouldn't drive my car without it, you know, and I, I consider this to be the same. It's just not worth it. And we can talk about how all three of these things kind of play different roles and work together. But a lot of people will try to piece one or two of these things together, but really they need all three. No, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Can you dive into it to maybe each of those a little in a little bit more, mm -hmm. like go through your three pillars and just kind of like elaborate on sort of the thinking behind each of those? Yeah, so the first one is forming your business. And a lot of people ask me about timing around this. And at least for me, having now started two official businesses, um, I did this way before I ever had a client, you know, probably as I was getting my website done and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I definitely recommend doing that early. Um, and 
typically, so we register in the state where we live and work. I'm not one of those lawyers that like recommends everyone sets up their business in Delaware. Yeah. Um, you definitely don't want to go to Delaware, by the way. No offense to anybody who's from Delaware. A little bit um, of offense. Not a ton. Yeah, yeah. Just People from Philly, like we don't, we really don't like New Yorkers, but then we like don't like Delaware either. Yeah. It's a, a very strange thing. It's but fair. <laughs> anyway, so you set up your business where you live and work um, and then you are really in our, I think with who we're talking to today, you're really thinking about setting it up as a sole proprietor or as an LLC. And so a sole proprietor is just that. It means that you're in business, but you're by yourself. You can't have business partners. You can't raise capital, like all of that kind of stuff. So it's like a very simple starter way. In some states, they don't even require you to register your business as a sole proprietor if that's what you're going to operate as, and others do. So it kind of depends on where you live. An LLC, however, you always have to register as an LLC if you want to be one. Um, and an LLC is what gives you personal liability protection. And that's that separation I was talking about earlier. That's what basically says that you as a person, as the owner of your business, are not simpatico with the actual business itself anymore, even if you own the business by yourself, like I do. Mm. So you can register as a what's called a sole member LLC. It just means you own the business by yourself. LLCs are able to raise capital. They can bring in partners like Ali and Adam can own the business together. You know, people can, there's a lot more flexibility. I always compare this to like um, when you're building a house, it's kind of like you're deciding from the beginning what the structure of the house is going to be. And so if you build a rancher, you can never turn that rancher into an apartment building. And if you build an apartment building, you're not really going to want to live in it by yourself. So there's, you really have to think about this structure but there are also certain pros and cons and benefits. So yeah. it's important that you find out like what, where your state, what those pros and cons are for you and all that kind of stuff. But typically these registration processes are not that different. There's a handful of states that make it more difficult. Like New York, for example, you have to yeah. like publish in a newspaper to get an LLC. There's some like weird things here and there, but overall it's actually pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, Kate hopped in on YouTube and asked, uh, to talk a little bit about the business insurance piece of it. So, I mean, I think insurance is a big part of mitigating risk as well. You're sort of like protecting against all the bad stuff. Legal is part of protecting, mitigating your risk and liabilities. Um, talk a little bit about how an LLC or DBA or setting up your business, making it actually legit matters in terms of um, business insurance or where those things overlap. Yeah. So this is so important because when you get the LLC, for example, that's when you've now separated yourself personally. So like, great, if you get sued, then hopefully you'll be able to put yourself in the position that you say, I personally can't be sued or included in this. But now you're still financially on the hook. So even if your business gets sued, your business would have to pay for a lawyer and pay any sort of settlement or a judgment that's found against you. So business insurance, what that does is that if you get sued, if your business gets sued for something that's covered by your business insurance policy, then they provide you with a defense attorney, they pay that attorney's fees, and then if there's a settlement or a judgment found against the business, they pay that with that within your policy limits. It's just like any other insurance. Yeah. You obviously owe a deductible, so you always wanna know, like if you have business insurance already, you want to know what your deductible is, you wanna know generally what's covered, what they've excluded, all that kind of stuff. Um, but generally speaking, for our purposes, you're you're looking at two different kinds of business insurance. Um, they'll, they'll put them on the same policy, but it's professional liability, otherwise known as E&O or errors and omissions. Yep. And then the second one is commercial general liability, which like Ali and Adam have for having a physical space and having property, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you were wondering if that helps in COVID, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, there's so. There was a, thanks to SARS, like a, a couple of years ago, there is a exclusion in all policies pretty much yeah. now for pandemics. So yeah, yeah, there goes that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, if it's real bad, we can't help. But if it's yeah. like a little bit bad, probably can't help either. But if it's a medium, bad, maybe. This is uh, one of the things I'm always teaching customers to do is how to maximize their insurance because I always tell them that business insurance's job every day is to wake up and figure out how to not cover things that you thought you were paying for the whole time. And yeah. so it's really important. Like there are a couple little tricks that we can talk over, but there it's really important for, for example, one of the things I'm seeing through this COVID process is that people got business insurance for one thing like pre COVID and now they're doing their work in a different way today. Yeah. Like they're doing it online or they're not seeing people in person anymore and they haven't updated their business insurance policy. So that would be really important to do. Yeah. It looks like we might turn into an insurance salesman. Mary has another question uh, where 
um, which is a good question. Where does one, which I struggled with for a very mm -hmm. long time. Um, where does a person go and get business insurance? So you get a business insurance from a business insurance agent. The problem is really finding a business insurance agent who understands what you do. So that's been something that over the last uh, three plus years in business, I've, I've gotten an education in and found some like key people that are really good or something yeah. like that. But I, I guess I'll tell you more about like what I wouldn't do. So one is that I don't think it's helpful to just like, no offense to Geico, I love Geico, but like, it's not helpful to just like call up like Geico and get business insurance. You kind of want somebody who's maybe more specific that you can speak to who will understand what kind of business that you have and yeah. how you work with people and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then you want to be as descriptive as possible in your business insurance application so that you can make a good argument for yourself later on if they deny a claim that you included it in your insurance application. Yeah. Mary, if you have, you could probably DM either of us and we can yeah. uh, maybe DM Sam. I, I, I uh, have business insurance through one of my to do's in midst COVID has been to review that more because mm -hmm. I had it once. Uh, I had it once cause we had problems at the studio and we were supposed to have insurance commercial, uh, well, CGL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have it. And I was like, Hey, this problem happened. And then our landlords said, yeah, your insurance should cover that. And I was like, Oh, good point. And then I went and got insurance. Uh, so that's happened. Uh, but then I, so I just, I asked a couple of friends and I've had a good relationship, but we haven't had to really like use anything. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's always good. Yeah. I would go Mary. The thing I would say would be, set up a, a meeting with three different people and right. a lot, like don't do what I did where I just talked to one person and it sounded good. So I did that and I didn't think about it anymore. Um, just talk to three people and you'll get a good sense of, you'll probably have done the most, you'll be in like the top 1% of small business owners doing research. Yeah. So um, we'll talk a little bit about, is there anything, so maybe this like insurance, but in other things you've, you've worked with enough coaches who are doing, you know, they're either, you, I know you work with a lot of health coaches or people kind of in that space um, and business coaches and things like that for those people, for a health coach or for a designer or for a freelance independent person, they're working remotely. They're not going to have somebody like fall and trip in front of mm -hmm. inside of their studio, or they're not going to do a medical procedure that hurts somebody. You know, they're not a doctor. Um, it, it seems like these things have a very low risk what are some of those? Let's just think about those people specifically. What are the things that those people need to be paying attention to? Or what have you seen that those folks like specifically people in this industry really need to make sure they have, you know, X, Y, and Z, whether that's with their content or their branding or their even insurance. Yeah. I think that for the most part, you know, I see, I see almost two issues. I see like offensive and defensive issues. So on the offensive side, a lot of people in my community are struggling with making sure that they can get paid, right? Like, so they send out a contract, but then they're not sure before they come to me, they're like, not sure that their contract backs them up to actually, you know, reach out to that client and say like, Hey, Adam, you haven't paid your bill, you have yeah. to pay, but they're not sure that they have a leg to stand on. And then if that person goes to them, they don't know if they can do something about it. Um, a lot of copying, I was actually chatting with Ali about this the other day, a lot of copying and mimicking online, like stealing content, images, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of that even, even happens to me. Um, and then uh, on the more like defensive side, I think what I'm concerned about in our industry and what I see happen is like people don't uh, people don't think that they I think when people have not practiced law, they don't they think that like there's more self responsibility here than there really is. And mm -hmm. so if you give somebody advice, for example, and then they choose to implement that advice without ever talking to their doctor or their lawyer or their accountant or whoever, you can still be on the hook for that. So I think a lot of people think like, well, I told him to do it. I figured he'd check with his doctor first or whatever. And that's not really like a thing here. So yeah. that that I'm concerned about is that people don't sometimes don't understand the, the like reverberating effects of their advice or their yeah. information. And also people staying within their scope of practice. Um, so really like, you know, a lot of people think if I, give the disclaimer that I'm not a doctor, lawyer, accountant, nurse, you know, whatever, that like, then I can just say whatever I want. And it's like, no, it actually has to be that you tell people that and then that you don't do anything that falls under the definition of doctor, lawyer, whatever, yeah. if you're not that thing. 
Yeah, which is why I have you come and talk about these things, <laughs> up answering questions about yeah. legal needs. Um, yeah, that because it's it's uh, you get thrown into those conversations a lot. Whether if you're a health coach, someone's going to be talking to you about a whole bunch of different things, and mm-hmm. if you're doing those things digitally or remotely, you can't see. You know, there's a lot of information that you can't figure out when you're interacting with somebody. Uh-huh. Yeah, and as as Ali and Adam, for example, were helping Semi build out her unmeasured program, which is a virtual online bar membership, then you know came up all these issues of like, what if someone takes this and gets hurt? And do people understand that they don't have to push? Like, if something's hurting them, they can stop, and all of these issues. But yeah. one of the interesting things about the way we all do business now online is that people. I mean, I always say to, to clients like, you want to set up your business so that people are buying things while you sleep. And so how do we protect the stuff? Because you're not, you're not like interviewing people before they buy your stuff, right? People buy my stuff at all hours of the night. And so you have to have like things in place that are protecting you along the way. Yeah, no, that's very, yeah, that's very, it's very true. You don't get to withhold some advice or or to customize it for people when everybody's just sort of jumping into it. Um, I had another question for you. It's kind of like a different topic a little bit. So because uh, and I'm looking at the people who are asking questions and I'm knowing our audience a little bit, like a lot of people have, um, do you need to do a DBA of your own name or how do you, you know, it's so like our friend Simi or you have your own, um, business. A lot of it is your name associated with it. Um, how does a person do that? Do they have to set up an LLC that is just their name? Do they have a DBA? How do you think about those things? If you're like, I just want to keep it my name. Yeah, like, you could. Is. Yeah, you could do it like, um, for example, like obviously my full name is Samantha. So like I could do Samantha Vanderbilt LLC and then do a DBA as Sam Vanderbilt because it's like my nickname, but that's also what I go as in in commerce. So you could do something like that. Just like Simi is not her full name. So she could, she could actually like register it that way. So some people will do that. Some people will, um, do like Sam Van Rielen coaching LLC and then do the DBA as my name. So you can, I, I do recommend when people want to go by their name that you do put some thought and attention into this piece of it, because yeah. I don't want people to get confused that you are just acting like as a person online. And I think one of the myths that makes me the most nervous about LLC is that people tend to treat them a little bit like a checkbox. Like if I just get an LLC, then everything's cool. I can like go do whatever I want. And actually, you have to act like an LLC moving forward all the time in order to be afforded the protection, that that personal liability protection. So we can talk about it if you want. But there are a couple of things that if you have an LLC, you have to be doing all the time to make sure you get it. Separating, I mean, to to make sure that it's enacted, right? Is like separating bank accounts and a whole host of other. You have to have clean financial records. Yeah. So there has to be like all these people that are always telling me, no, no, I'm good at like, I I know when I like see that charge from Nordstrom on there, I just know that it's my personal thing. It's like, no, no, no. That's the whole point. You have to have it separate. You shouldn't be using business money to dip into other stuff. Just pay yourself and then go buy the thing at Nordstrom or whatever. Um, And you have to keep those records clean. You have to use that LLC moniker consistently right when you're using the corporate name or have the dba tied back to the llc your business bank account should be in the name of the llc your business insurance should be in the name so like everything really should tie back to it together yeah yep um i've made all of those mistakes i was like sitting here being just like dang it sam um <laughs> it's, it's funny so many no it's it's good i've learned to not be uh it should be like okay just like fix that and that's better than uh, th- I think so many, so many people start their business. There's always a couple of different, like typical starting places. Some people go start with a lawyer. Some people go meet with an attorney first because yeah. they think to do, or they, they go meet with an accountant or they go yeah. meet with a marketing person. They're like, I need a logo. So sometimes like uh, an LLC is step one, a logo step one, or uh, a business plan is step one. Yeah. And, and, So you and I get to talk to a lot of people who maybe don't have the other things going on. And a a person can start in any of those. We've watched plenty of people be successful and start in any of those different areas. Um, It's just important that you eventually get the other ones done too. So um, yeah, you could clean it up. Yeah. We've got another question from Kate, which is awesome because I had made a note to ask this anyways, or to dive into this. So Kate had asked, can you get into the parts of a proposal or a contract? Does the whole scope of work, need to be in legalese. I know you've got some, um, you could maybe even talk about some of the things that you offer people 
if they hit up to your website or things like that, because I, I think you probably answer, you dive into a lot more depth um, in some of the resources that you have. But I'm, this one I'm curious about, and I know I know Kate's business, she's a designer. We mm-hmm. deal with this a little bit. And we, we, amongst our team, we go back and forth sometimes of when I'm putting a proposal or a con- when I'm putting a contract together to have somebody sign to agree that we will deliver something and they will give us money or they will do something. Um, we're always curious of like, how descriptive do we need to be mm-hmm. in that contract? Like, do I need to say like color? Like if I'm doing branding for somebody, do I need to include color schemes or like, what is, how, how do I as a creative person or a designer think about what needs to be included in there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So Kate, I, I'll, I'll address the second part of your question first, which is that lawyers have done a really good job at tricking people into thinking that things had to be written by lawyers, which they don't, right? Like it doesn't have to be in legalese. It's just that obviously a lawyer has a trained eye. We have a way of saying things in a way. I also think we have a way of saying things in a way that makes it sound scary. So it makes it sound very enforceable and all that kind of stuff. But also we just know what to look for. So it's not necessarily that your contracts have to be written in legalese. It's just that what I see most often is that when contracts are like DIY put together yourself, you know, copy and pasted from a friend, as I say, um, then I think that there are key like missing provisions that you might not think are important Mm -hmm. or a lot of people will say to me, like, I didn't even understand what it meant. So I just deleted it and it turns out to be a really important thing. So I hope that that answers that part. and then, oh, yeah, right. no, you, uh, I had another point of this, and this is mm-hmm. a not legal perspective of this, but you, you had mentioned, you had alluded to it in the beginning in a part where sometimes a contract is really about ensuring that you get paid. And that's the yeah. goal of that contract is being like the main goal of that contract is making sure you get money. Sometimes that's the, the main intent. And one of the, there's a number you can, you can solve that problem through a contract standpoint, but you can also solve that contract. You solve that problem through maybe the wonder jam. We had a real problem of this where we did with a typical thing that everybody does where they split up payments and like 50% up front or and then 50% later or something like that. And so we would get 99% of the way through a project. And then clients were like, make that last 1% really, really long. And I understood it because I was like, once this is done, like they want to make sure that every I is dotted and T is crossed and they're like holding back on that payment. There's no incentive for them to finish this project at all. And there's a huge incentive for us to just like get done so we can get to the next project. And so we split up our payments. We have like our payments get split up into five or six microscopic chunks, even amidst COVID where um, we'll have a project done, you know, start and end in a week. We still have three different payments that come through tied to, either review sessions or something like that. And so um, I would say that to Kate, but I also, cause I know your contract can't solve everything, um, but I'll let you kind of like continue on in the answering it from a, uh, from a legal standpoint, what, what's important to have in those contracts proposals. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you shared that actually, because I, I'm always teaching customers that this is like, yes, half the contract problem, which I've essentially solved for them by writing it. But the, but the other part is actually de- like deliverability and like the way that a client's onboarded and how the actual work is delivered to them. And I think that's all what Adam's talking about is like the way you can get yourself into a pickle is when you've sent somebody all of the work and then you're like, now give me my money. It's like, well, why did you give them the work before you got them? Right. So you can not only set that up on your end, just in terms of your process and your method of like delivering your work, mm-hmm. but then that can be spelled out in your contract too. So they kind of work hand in hand, like your contract can spell out the fact like that the work will not, the final product will not be turned over until the last payment is completed or you know, something like that. Yeah. But you really have a lot of flexibility this is where i'm always encouraging uh entrepreneurs to to like put your ceo hat and on and you get to decide this process for how you want to take payments like if ali and adam have decided that they're okay with the like breaking up payments in that way and then delivering work in a certain way like they have that flexibility you there's not really a right or a wrong it's actually more that you get to decide how you do that. So yeah. your your parts of your contract should be very specific to whatever you decide, right? So like Adam was uh, describing earlier, like, should we be as detailed as saying like what colors and this kind of stuff? What I see more often is that you should be detailed about the things that end up becoming a problem. And so somebody like in Ali and Adam's 
point, like a situation where they've worked with so many people and they've seen it, they've seen it all at this point, you know that like you have to be specific about the number of revisions that are given. Like in design work, that's huge. Like how many rounds are we going back and forth? And what is your response time to those revisions? Like, do you get back to them within 48 hours? They have to get back to you within 48, you know, whatever. And going through all of that, maybe even um, limiting like the scope of revisions, right? So like not sending me one sample of design, I mean, like I've changed my mind. I want a completely different thing. Like that's a new project, right? So you can be as descriptive as possible. And this stuff in my experience um, gets better over time. It's kind of like a nice wine. Yeah. <laughs> so the more times that I think in, in my experience, the, the little like bumps in the road that you experience are gonna become line items on your contracts and they kind of grow with you because the first time that somebody asks for like 17 revisions, you realize, oh, I have to tell the person two revisions and then you have to limit the time and all of that kind of stuff. So you really just want to be as descriptive as possible. And with payment, I would be with payment and the work, like how they tied together, I would be as descriptive as possible with like what your process is. Like, do you have to get paid first before you release it and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kate, if that answer, if you, if there's a follow up in there, just be sure to drop yeah. it in. Sam, maybe just for a second while there's some folks in here, um, and then we'll, we'll ask a couple other questions. Can you talk a little bit about maybe if people are maybe interested in, in solidifying their business from a legal standpoint a bit more, what are some resources that you've put together that people might want to jump into? Yeah. So if you're just starting out and you're kind of confused about where to start with legally protecting your business, you're not really sure what you need, then definitely your best step is to watch my free workshop called the first uh, five steps to legally protect and grow your online business. So it's a free on-demand workshop you can watch on my website. Um, samvanderillen.com slash free dash workshop. And then um, in terms of like actually implementing these contracts, I help entrepreneurs in two ways. So I offer all of my contracts um, a la carte. Like, I'm going to pull up your yeah, like And I'm showing you, you yeah. can go to the shop page and get any of those um, a la carte or in my ultimate bundle program, you get 10 legal templates plus 23 on demand video trainings that teach you how to form your business, work with clients online, and protect your content with trademarks and copyrights. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So yeah, <laughs> visit, yeah. Head up, head up Sam's website. If you need a little bit more, we've had, we've had some buddies who've hopped into that and, um, most people not unless you have a legal background for some reason, <laughs> like you had a family member who's a lawyer or you yourself were, were a lawyer and have done something else. Um, this is something that people, is important for your business. It's not something you need to like, it, it doesn't need to, um, it, you don't need to spend hours and hours every day thinking about it, but you do need to take care of some things. You got to check off some boxes and make sure that's handled and then operate in a way that, that works really well. So um, get educated a bit if you can. Yeah. And I wish I had or far earlier, but you know. I always say to people, you don't have to become a lawyer. It's like, I hopefully I've done a lot of this work for you already. But the but I think CEOs know like enough about this stuff just to know what's going on. And I, I don't know what Adam thinks of this as an expert business coach, but um, I've found it helpful to like set aside some CEO time, whether that means like looking over my numbers or getting my own legal stuff, you know, and doing more of these tasks yep. that I just don't I don't want to do them either yeah. right so, but setting aside that time and not letting it continue to like fester has been very helpful yep no that's cool we have another question it's actually as you were talking about this i was curious um i wanted to talk so jenna asked a question mm -hmm. um being on the other side of this scenario so you are a small business owner who's hired another small business owner another person and this happens a lot right we have freelancers yeah. we have coaches who hire other freelancers or other coaches and Maybe those things haven't followed through. You know, that they're um, for better, for worse. Artists can have a uh, reputation of being flaky. Uh, I always think the Wonder Jam's best asset is that Allie is like addicted to deadlines. She has like a, yeah. a psychological problem where she always hits them. And uh, I think I can remember like three times where she didn't. And um, it probably wasn't her. I mean, it wasn't her fault. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So talk a little bit about that. So maybe you're on the other side of this, you have a contract with somebody and you feel like these things aren't, it's not working out in some way. What are sort of your options and how do you remedy that sort of stuck situation? 
Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that this happened, Jenna. Um, I want to talk about from first like a preventative aspect and then what you would do if this happened just so that this doesn't happen to you again or anybody else. Um, so one thing, this is actually why I, in my ultimate bundle program, I added a training for entrepreneurs to learn how to like read and interpret other people's contracts that they send. So when you hire a web designer or a copywriter, I want you to be able to look at that and know how it affects you for this exact reason. Yeah. Um, cause I do see this happen a lot, unfortunately. So, um, on the preventative end, I would obviously look at the contract, you know, interpret it as the best you can and understanding almost from the reverse, like when is money due, you know, do you have to pay all this stuff up front, but you don't get any work in in return. I think there's probably like a happy balance you could reach with a designer or whoever you're hiring um, that you could get like something for what you've paid for already before you're giving them more money. Um, so at least, you know, things are moving along. Um, so there's that whole piece on the preventative side. Once yeah. this has actually happened, like unfortunately it has to Jenna, then from there, your option is to go speak with an attorney. Um, I mean, obviously, as a consumer, I think my first um, route would always be just to give them a final warning, for lack of a better term, of like, I'm going to go speak to an, an attorney to get my money back for this, but I want to give you one opportunity to give me a refund. Um, one thing that comes to mind for me when Jenna said this is like, it, contracts are all about performance. So if there hasn't been a performance, which is the delivery of the work, then you can demand a refund yeah. um, unless they can turn around and perform, unless they can give you the product that you've paid for. If they can't or they don't respond or whatever, then you obviously can go speak with an attorney or you can go now if you wanted to. Um, and then you're looking at suing this person. But um, just with the way that our legal system works, you're going to be paying for the attorney. Maybe they would take you um, on what's called contingency, which is like, if you get money, then they just take a cut of that. But for this amount of a project, that's not, you, we're typically talking about like slip and falls at targets for those kinds of things. Yeah. So yeah, so this is would be more probably out of your pocket. So as a business owner, I think it's kind of a cost benefit analysis as to like, how much time and energy do I want to spend? Um, and see what your options are. But obviously you could talk to a lawyer about that. Yeah. Yeah. Jenna, I think we, and we've been on the both sides of those equations where you're like, I don't know if this is, I got what I was supposed to get or what I thought I was going to get, or I, I'm pretty clearly didn't get whatever yeah. was agreed to um, whether that's in a contract or just verbally. And there's, there's a real, it's, it's almost like in, it's nice having a business partner uh, because we kind of can take both sides of this as we're discussing what to do in these scenarios. But you have to take your emotional piece out of it a little mm -hmm. bit and walk into it and think sort of what leverage do I have right now? Um, do you have leverage of, I'm going to leave some kind of review on your business page. Mm -hmm. Do you have leverage of, uh, I'm not going to deliver a final payment or I'm going to something, or do you have leverage of, you know, legal action in some way or suing them or pursuing that. Um, and I think really thinking through which of those options works out for you, it's almost like, sometimes there's like the, the emotional just frustration and anger where you want to prove yeah. a point, not saying that that's what Jenna's doing, but like I, when I'm in those scenarios, I'm kind of like, I'm real mad and I want to make this hurt for somebody else. But often doing that causes you extra work. And I think just thinking through what can I do moving forward? Like, how do I get out of this? How do I move forward? Do I need to learn this lesson um, in some way? I think sometimes like, Sometimes people just don't do, do a good job. Maybe they have a bad month or weeks or they're having a bad year and they can't deliver on it. And maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe they're actually bad at their job. There's plenty of people who are not very good or consistent at the things that they do. Um, but yeah, I think, I think listing out your options mm -hmm. in all angles, not just the legal angle and figuring out how do you tackle that is, um, is, the, is the next move. For sure. Definitely. Yeah, you're right. Um, that's no, Jenna wrote, Jenna wrote some other things. Um, mm. Oh yeah. So this, what's funny. So the wonder jam is like, I, I hear these things a lot because the wonder jam, like we've done this for seven years, we've built like a thousand websites and it, so there's a little bit of like, if, if we don't keep, doing it 
then we're, that's bad. People aren't going to keep coming. Like I expect to go to Starbucks and get a coffee when I order one. It'll probably taste uh, to me like trash, but to other mm-hmm. people, they like that. And, but I expect, like I expect that there's consistency there. And so for a lot of people who understand how to make logos or they worked at an agency or had another job or that they knew how to make websites, it's easy to spin up your own, like own LLC, put up a Squarespace site, call yourself a designer and take on a couple of clients. It's, it's not hard to impress people. Um, and so there's a real, I, I almost, I wish I could go into the mind of people. And I try to do this when some of our other workshops and help them hire creatives a bit more judiciously. And cause there are some things that's like super low risk for your business, like hiring an illustrator to do illustrations of something for your website or social, like give that person money, high five them, send them inspiration. If you like the type of work they do, like let them do the thing. But then if you have, if you have a significant business and the website is a big part of it, um, you're going to be in trouble. If you know, if that doesn't work out, that's a big deal. It's, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's really bad for your business. There's a lot of risk there. And so n- navigating all of that is, is a huge, huge deal. Um, and your, your contract's going to be scrutinized differently and you should look through those expenses differently. So, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, Jen, I almost see this yeah. on my end, by the way, of like, you know, I would be so curious to see this person uh, who offered to build their website. Like, I would be so curious to see his contract if he even had one. And so, it's kind of funny because on my end, I have a lot of people come to me because they want to look and appear more professional. And so, I think when you're on the consumer end, you can remember that, like, if someone sends you a contract and it looks really janky and like they've put it together themselves, then my concern would be like what's in here for me that protects me if they haven't like taken the time or attention to put this together. So that would be something I would probably consider as when I was hiring someone too. I know. I think we lost Adam. <laughs> well, I'm still here in case I'm still here in case anybody has any questions. You could ask me until Adam gets back on. He might have just had to re sign in. We'll hang on. We'll give him a minute. We'll take a coffee break. Oh, you're welcome, Jenna. I hope it was helpful. And I'm sorry to hear that that. I'm sorry to hear that that happened. Jenna, if you're still here and you can hear me or see me, um, one thing that's been helpful to um, me in the past has been just asking someone to get on the phone with me. So um, I think sometimes kind of like Adam was saying, we can get really tied up in this um, as like, uh, you know, emotionally, right? We can get upset about it. Like, obviously I would be really upset about this too. But, um, oh, hey, Tim. Um, But if it were me, I would probably ask this website designer to just get on the phone with me and talk and just have a face to face conversation. If you could talk with him and just say, like, look, it's totally okay if this project got beyond you. But if it did get beyond you, then like, could we just give me the money back so that I can take that to someone else who can complete this project? Because what's actually important is that I just complete the project like I need my website. So I found it helpful before to just I think we get really tied up in like thinking, what should we do? And we forget kind of about the human element that we can just hop on the phone and, uh, and we can talk. Adam's yeah. back. <laughs> My, our power flickered in the studio. I like lost I like <laughs> the whole thing shut down and it just went all blank. And I was like, what the heck, Sam, you're, you're truly a trooper and you just kept powering through. I got and it. And <laughs> that wasn't planned. Sam didn't know I was going to magically leave. Uh, I Nathan it. figured it out though. He, he, he knew what was going on. So um, I didn't know if it was me. I was like, I think so. But I was just telling <laughs> while you were gone, Adam, I was saying to Jenna yeah. that I found it helpful in the past to ask people to hop on the phone and just say almost like so I think sometimes we forget that that guy who's designing her website, he's probably freaking out, too. And so if you can give him an out and say, like, you can have out of this, you don't have to design my website anymore. I just need my money back for the part that wasn't completed um, because I need to take that to Ali and Adam so that they can actually like finish my website. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Real quick, a couple of questions. Mary asked, does your website include sample contracts? The answer is? Yes. I mean, I, yes. I sell them. They're not free, right. but I do, <laughs> um, just to be honest. But yeah, I sell uh, all of the templates a la carte, and then also they're bundled yeah. in my ultimate bundle. And that's what, uh, Sam is not our lawyer. Sam represent Sam is, um, but our lawyer, if you showed up and asked for things that you would get temp, most lawyers operate mostly off templates anyway. Yeah. So, um, especially for like simple things. Um, our friend Tim hopped in and he said, hi, Sam. <laughs> I, so, I know I got very excited when I saw Tim was here. I went, hi. I know me too. Me too. <laughs> if we can get Osh to chime in though, that's oh, the real. I'd be so happy. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Tim, I have a book recommendation for you, by the way. I was just thinking about that this morning. <laughs> got a parent, your dinosaur son. No, not that far. <laughs> <laughs> Osh has that covered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So we got Nathan asked a uh, question. Um, not that Tim's comment wasn't a serious legal question, but uh, Nathan has one. So how template, how templated do you think contracts can be for 1099 contractors in this field? Um, do you advise small businesses to establish a single template that they all can have? Um, so Nathan, I know in some of his professional work is, is probably hiring a number of contractors to help in a bunch of different scenarios. So do you advise people to have standard ones, whether they're hiring, you know, a bunch of different things or like, what does that look like? Yeah, so I have a template for independent contractors. That's 1099 contractors. It's when you're hiring someone as an independent contractor versus an employee. In America, we owe employees a whole host of like rights and responsibilities that we don't owe to independent contractors. So it's always advantageous to try to hire someone as an independent contractor until it becomes financially advantageous to hire mm -hmm. them as an employee. Yep. That's usually down the line. But for this, um, yeah, you can typically start with a template. I mean, I think the people who have my independent contractor template, um, if they're hiring different independent contractors, they'll replicate it and then send that out to different people. Um, but typically when we're hiring somebody like you've described, it's all very similar stuff. It's, it's more about like what kind of work they're producing for you, what they have access to. So really in a, in a, contract for an independent contractor, we're just trying to establish that we're trying to make sure that it's clear that they're an independent contractor so that they can't come back later and say, you didn't pay me overtime, you didn't pay me uh, for health insurance, you didn't do all this stuff, because you don't owe that to an independent contractor like you might for an employee. Yeah. So we're trying to establish that we're establishing the scope of their work. We're also establishing like their access rights, right? Like your passwords, um, the fact that work that they create for you is, is actually owned by your business. They don't get to retain any intellectual property rights in the work that they produce for your business, all of that kind of stuff. So um, that's, I, I think that can all be pretty much addressed in a template and then yeah. it could be edited as needed. Yep. Yep, exactly. There's some of those things that are a really big deal. Um, and then to add on to what we've been saying, so thinking through legal considerations as a mitigation of risk, there's other practices that you can develop that also mitigate the risk that would be in a 1099 relationship with a contractor, such as, and this was how we were advised because I was as our team was growing, we had yeah. a, a number of people be contract num contractors, a number who were um, W-2 employees. And we actually gave everyone a choice. Some of them had enough of their own freelance work where they understood how to navigate taxes and wanted to stay a 1099 yeah. person, which was interesting. Um, but the, the, so like having a, a system and process for how fire files are getting delivered to you. Is mm -hmm. it something where people are sending you like, JPEGs? Are they sending you raw files? Are they sending you like in, in understanding what those look like and who owns those pieces? That can be a real thing. So if you, uh, and Nathan understands this, but for others listening, for those of you who were, um, if you're having a designer work through those things, those are something that designers are very clued into as far yeah. as do you want the raw files of a photo shoot? Most photographers will charge you way more if you the second you say that sentence and the um, and like the design files, like the actual artboards and design files that somebody has used to create your branding or website or things like that. And if you want those because you want to have access and replicate those in the future, you're typically going to pay a bunch more, uh, significantly more uh, to do that work because you're a little bit like shortcutting that individual's employment. Um, but, but that also happens often. Um, so just, thinking about what are those things that you actually want from them and then mitigating passwords was always a big one um, yeah. for us and understanding what, so we, we, part of doing that is we, all of our 1099 contractors had a 
Wonder Jam G Suite account mm -hmm. because it allowed us as admins to control, like we would retain all of the emails and we'd retain all of the files that they're using inside of Google and things like that. And so not that I, I have yet to ever go back and look through any of those things, but in the random off chance that somebody just jets and leaves or something like that, and I need to do something I'm able to, which mitigates that risk um, that we have on our end. So um, yeah. great question. That's a, it's a big one. And I think hiring contractors, if you're good at it and you treat people well and you set those things up, you can, you can really take advantage of, um, it's a, it's a real advantage to be able to interact with folks that way. So, yeah. Um, depending on where you live, this is becoming more of an issue and pre COVID this was like really heating up. And then I think, you know, states have other things to worry about, but, uh, in California, for example, you can't hire people as independent contractors anymore who perform like core duties of the work, you know? Yeah. So if, if you're a coach, for example, like I have one person I'm thinking of who's in California and she hires all these co-coaches cause her program has gotten so big, but that's like exactly what yeah. she does. So she can't hire them as independent contractors yeah. anymore. And there's so many, yeah. I mean, we've, we've worked one of the, we're, the only time we've ever had to bring a lawyer into a business relationship was we worked with like a middleman marketing firm. It was just like a one person and he presented as, as a large agency, but it was just him. Oh. And he just like won contracts and then sliced everything out to contractors. Um, and then he, he actually got really stuck in our position because he had like a 45 day net payment terms with the client. And then we had a or he had a 30 day net payment with them and a 45 day with us. So it gave him like a 15 day, but he wasn't getting paid on time. Oh. And, uh, we were like, this is out of scope, but then the client told him it wasn't out of scope. So he was on the hook for something, but you know, so he was anyways, there's, we were like running his business and he was just taking a cut off the, the top. Oh of man. The so, um, it's like a marketing Ponzi scheme. <laughs> that's exactly what it was. So, um, and you can cure that in the future with having a no assignment clause in your contracts, which means that people can't take your agreement, your contract, and assign the work to other people without asking for you, asking you through written consent first. So you could block someone from being able to do that, or at least give yourself like the enforcement mechanism. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, no, that's really cool. Um, Sam, thank you. I Thank think you. you've nailed so many things. We've answered a bunch of questions. I think we touched on a lot. Um, gosh, we talked about hiring, forming things, contracts, business getting insurance. started, business insurance. Those are most of the scary things I can think of. Contracts <laughs> is always a thing. Yeah. An LLC or a sole proprietorship or a S corp or things like that is always another thing. DBAs are a thing. Um, if my last thing I'll say, and then if you have sort of like any um, final thoughts, you can sort of throw them out or anything that you feel like most people are missing. But one is as you get a business rolling, and this is for the, the people who are building businesses or brands right now, as you get a business rolling, develop a great relationship with somebody who can give you legal advice, not just somebody who reviews your contracts, but who can sort of help you think about what's important for your business. And so it's, it's better to pay someone for like three hours of consultation than it is to um, just have them create a contract for you. And so go for the consultation because that will last you for years. And if you understand what you're needing to do, you'll understand where you can go find templated what templated contracts or where yeah. you need things to be reviewed. So do that. Also, you know, talk to an, a tax specific accountant who understands taxes because the way taxes taxes are enacted in a way based on how your business is legally defined. And so yep. There are some things that a lawyer would tell you you don't need to do, like other than getting paid more, converting to an S corp doesn't really do anything from a legal protection standpoint for your business, mm -hmm. but it does a number of things from a tax standpoint for your business is if it's of the right size. And so, um, and the third thing I always tell people to get is like a business finance sort of like CFO brain who's strategically helping you to think about the money of your business. And so like a lawyer uh, or legal advice tax advice and your just overall financial advice are three different things, but they often overlap really dramatically and learning how to juggle the advice of those three people is you, you will hit another level of what you can do with your business. If you're not just, I probably spent four years just asking my tax accountant what I should be doing And my tax account super smart and runs a profitable business in a whole bunch of other ways. But, gave me tax advice, which is cool. And lawyers give me different advice and 
a CFO brain gives me a whole other set of things to worry about. And so um, you got to, you got to carry all of those things. So this is kind of my final thought is we, I know you, you touched on a whole bunch of different pieces um, because legal considerations to get into all facets of the business. So is there anything kind of your final, final thoughts from Sam? Um, no, I think, I mean, I think Adam nailed it, but just making sure like Adam says to have these things covered. I mean, this is why I, created the business I did because I want you guys to have more than just a contract. You you have to know why it says what it says and how to actually use it. Um, it's like having a really fancy tool that you don't know how to use. So you want to make sure that whoever you decide to go to, you can get that kind of information. Yeah. Um, and also I'm with Nathan that what's really scary is bad coffee because <laughs> Adam and I are coffee snobs. So I totally get that. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's truth. That's, so that's true. Truth. Every day I choose not to post like uh, social media content about my love affair with coffee because me too. I just get redundant. So um, me too. It's been fun to order from new roast, new to me roasters, I should say, like from around the country, and try to support small businesses. But um, right now, really liking Ruby Coffee. If anyone's tried it, my husband's from Northern Wisconsin, and uh, yeah. actually like one of the best roasters in the country. It's like yeah. in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin, and. Uh, it's been awesome. So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Ruby coffee. So good. Um, it's really good. I know Nathan hangs around the mission coffee folks in Columbus. Yeah. Their stuff's great. One line coffee is reopening today. If you have to wear a mask, if you go in there, mm. um, our pals at Grandview grind are adding a couple of other patio seats. Um, Jenna has got some recs for us. Reza. Reza's. I've never heard of that one, but I will check it out. I like counter culture too. They're in North Carolina. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in Philly, uh, we have a lot of good ones too. But. Yeah, 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 you do have a bunch of good ones in Philly. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like when I when I would travel, that was all I did. As I would go to um, a million different coffee shops, so it's like my that's what like all I did. I once went to Manhattan for a day, and all I did was uh, <laughs> we're getting more comments about coffee than we did. <laughs> yeah, that's so uh, true. Let's go. Uh, let's check it out. Yeah, Razors was one. Hadn't heard about Ruby. People are going to send us a uh, Texas about coffee. <laughs> oh, make me happy. I've never heard of that one. Adam, for a while, I wanted to start a blog because I love travel. So I was going to start a blog where I just profiled different coffee shops I went to around the world because I've been to some crazy, amazing coffee shops in the middle of nowhere in the Middle East and in Asia. It's like, I just would love to do that one day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, do Be that. very niche, but it sounds like we have an audience. <laughs> well, I've got, yeah, well, I've got, uh, it's like connected to, two of my other business ideas that when I get some free time, I'll mess around with. So um, just a reminder, check out Sam's stuff on our website, which is in there. We'll, I'll link it in the comments below this video. Once we're, once we hop off here. Um, also, if you want to, the wonder jam has a thing called the gem club and the gem club is an online community. Um, it also downloads into a nice handy dandy app on your phone. So you can kind of just interact with it. I think of it personally, and I'm like the uh, host of that community. Uh, Often for me, it's been a really good practice to get me off of just instinctually checking social media. Um, I can like pop in there. Sometimes I just hop into the direct messages and talk to other members uh, for fun. And so it's it's a uh, it's a nice thing. So if you go to the Gym Club or the Gym Dot Club, um, if you go to the Wonder Jam's website, it's on there. And there's a free week trial, so you can like look through everything that's in there and then say that it's trash. There's a whole bunch of COVID. Um, resources that have been in there that's been super super cool to watch a bunch of different people sam included and and others who have understand legal or financial or just general information sharing that and making it easily accessible so it's been pretty valuable um but yeah hop in there and then we're running until i i always say until we can go to concerts again at an arena we'll keep the price uh a lot lower so we have like flat we have flattened the curve pricing that will be enacted until I can go see, uh, you know, we can go watch somebody. We can go watch like Travis Scott on his next tour. I think that's like the one that I would be interested in going to right now. So, it's a good one. Um, so yeah. So thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks Sam for being here. Appreciate it. If you have any more Thank questions, you. you can message us. Sam and I both hang out on the internet and we're not scared to talk to people. So um, say hi. Thank you. Thank you.